Good morning, everybody. This is Robin Nelson with another edition of Wrestle Popcast. And my guest who's going to be on this fun show with me is the hi hat Jim Phillips. How you doing today, my brother? Pretty good. So we are on here talking about WrestleMania 36 Part 1 After Show, Solitary Confinement. <laughs> what did you think of the name of that? I'm sure that's probably what it felt like to him. I think so too, man. And, you know, and if you notice in some of the matches, some of the wrestlers would out there be trying to play out with the audience, but there was no audience out there. I know, it's just like uh, going to the instinct, right? Selling to the crowd, even if there isn't one. <laughs> yeah, all right. Let's talk about some of the matches last night. Yeah, let's, uh, let's run them down, man. You know, Kabuki Warriors versus Bliss and Cross. I thought the match was decent. It could have been way better. I like the Kabuki Warriors for the fact that they sold. They sold, like you just said, even though there was no crowd, they sold it, man, and they were committed to it, and that was a good thing. I think so, too, and I love the Kabuki Royers, but I also like Alexa Bliss. Uh, she was doing her best to try to sell as well. I think the thing with Bliss and Cross, they've been building Nikki Cross as a sideline to Alexa Bliss this whole time, and slowly but surely, Nikki Cross has been growing, growing, growing. Last night, I think she pinnacle as far as her growth in that team they've got the belts now it's only natural for them to carry those belts and i would say that maybe they should carry them until SummerSlam, which is looking to be the next big show and then run a split between them feud them it's feud them into summer you know i think so too and i'm looking for SummerSlam as well and i'm hopefully um, every, hopefully this coronavirus will be destroyed so everybody can go and enjoy that huge spectacle. Whenever uh, all this stuff first started, and I don't want to make light of it, but you got to laugh where you can, my brother. We had to, I worked with, uh, in the kitchen at my job, a lot of the Latinas and Latinos, you know what I mean? They, they call it the virus. The virus! The virus is coming! So yeah, it was... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the virus will be over by then. I think so too. And I'm praying and positive vibes. Now let's talk about another match, uh, King Corbin versus Elias. And I love Elias a lot. There's a lot of haters that don't like him. And the whole thing about that whole match is, um, you know, the King Corbin wanted to forfeit before the match. And I think through that whole match between Corbin and Elias, it was all right, and they didn't have any chemistry between each other. It did feel kind of stale. I've been in general needs something to add to his mix to get him over. Maybe talk less. I'm not sure, but something is amiss. The guy can sell. I'm not saying he's a great wrestler, but he needs he needs to fine-tune something but Elias is the one that came out on top of this one with the backstory and Elias invested himself you know what I mean like fully in the match and that doesn't have anything to do with the crowd in himself you can see that he was himself and, and making himself feel it you know what I mean and that shows so I would say that even with the anchor of Baron Corbin Elias did well I think so, and, and um, you know, I enjoyed it, and I totally agree with you. Elias did put his uh, heart and soul and body into the match. I totally agree with you. Well, you don't get those. I mean, people are they're actors. They're they're actors. They're stuntmen. They're everything. But you don't get some of those facial expressions without being yourself invested in what you're doing. And he sold it, man. In my opinion. All right, let's talk about another match. I really enjoyed this match. I did enjoy. And if they had a audience out there, it would have made that whole match even more popping. Let's talk about the match for the Raw Women's Title. Uh, Becky Lynch taking on Shayna Baszler. That was one hell of a match. I mean, those guys put each other over good. There was a lot of great chemistry in it. And um, I'm a huge Becky fan, but I would have loved to saw uh, Shayna Baszler with the title. Yeah, I think that would have been better to further the story. Let me just say, as a, as a former long-haul driver, I've done a little bit of everything in my life. And i tell you what, that semi that 
Becky Lynch is riding around in is slick, son. That that's that is nice. I like that a lot. That's a beautiful truck. And during that match, I love how Becky uh, Lynch does the whole Bret Hart counter out of the clutch move. Yeah, I guess, exactly. I was going to say the exact same thing about the finish. It was kind of a nod to the Bret Hart Stone Cold Steve match that made so famous where Austin got rolled up and got the one, two, three. Almost the exact same finish. I think the match was a little short, in my opinion. I think for everything they did, I think they could have done without the bite angle, but for everything they did with the elimination chamber and everything it up, I think that match could have went, they should have went another 10 minutes with it, man, at least. You know, it was it was a little fast for me. Yeah, that whole elimination chamber match with Shanna Basler, she was on fire. She was uh, giving some beatings, man. She's just a beast. Yeah, yeah, that is for sure. I definitely, I definitely won't want to tangle with her. All right. Um, let's talk about the intercontinental match between Sami Zayn, Daniel Bryan, and Drew Glock. Okay, so I like the vibe between those guys, even though there wasn't a crowd. Sami Zayn usually needs that. He, he interacts so much with the audience. So going into that match, it was one of the ones that I thought for sure was going to fall flat, and it didn't, you know, so... That was a nice surprise. They were they worked real well together. I did too. I really enjoyed that match. I think that was one of my favorite matches of the night. I mean, um, I I just love Daniel Bryan, man. He just has that great in ring presence about himself, and he can go. I like the way that they're pairing him and Gulak together. They're similar in appearance. They're they're both technical wrestlers. Again, like I said earlier, with the. Bliss and Cross, I would like to see those two guys eventually work their way into a feud at a big show and give us some of the old school technical wrestling matches that we haven't seen in a long time, you know? Oh, I know. I would love to see it, too. I wouldn't mind seeing them um, as a tag team. Yeah. And see, be fine with me. Yeah. Put them as a tag team for a while and then feud them in some great, maybe like a best out of five series of matches. I, I would pop for that. Oh, I would too. I'd be marking like a little schoolboy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know something? I don't care what anybody says. We are in all pro wrestlers. We are all marks at a certain extent. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not a fan of the business, and you're in the business, then you're in the wrong place. You know what I mean? If you're just there to be negative reap the rewards of it if you've never been a fan of it and you hear that in all the the documentaries and stuff all the wrestlers do you hear them saying the same thing but it's really true if you're not a fan then, then there's no reason to you know i mean be there in my opinion let's talk about something wrong from that match though let's talk about what wasn't used let's talk about nakamura and cesaro those guys are so underused it's it, it bothers me Oh, it bothers me too. Not headlining in New Japan, and ever since he got here, WWE gave him his little. Every time somebody comes in new, they give him a little six month run. They'll strap him, they'll let him run with the title, and then they just drop him down the well. And right now, Nakamura is down the rabbit hole, man, and it's he. He should be headlining these shows. It I, makes me upset. I think so too, and he has that. Uh, great, uh, uh, you know, uh, charisma about himself. I think he should just leave WWE, either go back to New Japan or go over to All Elite Wrestling. Because over at All Elite Wrestling, they they would let, they would go with him and let him do whatever he wanted. I agree. I totally agree. And it's. I think they're probably going to work that angle eventually to the point out of those three guys, Nakamura on to turn. So they'll probably eventually have Cesaro and. And uh, Sami Zayn turn on Nakamura, you know what I mean, and, and turn him face. So that's what I'm thinking is going to happen. I hope that happens. That would be great. Now, um, <laughs> card guys, I'm sorry. The mid card guys are just really hurting right now because of the overabundance of talent. I mean, it's good to have a lot of talent, but you can get to a saturation point, and that's it hurts those guys that are in the mid card level. I think they should give some of the guys in the mid card level. Um, a bump up and uh, let them shine, you know. Maybe they can put up on some good uh, matches and get the crowd popping more and just, you know, push some of the um, stars out a little bit for a bit and just let those guys shine. I agree. Either that or even though it's not usually a good solution to the remedy or anything like that, they could they could bring back the European title and present another title for these guys to fight over, but... Do we really want to sit and, and watch another 10-minute title match that they just shit on? You know what I mean? So it's 
six of one, half a dozen of the other. Oh, I know. It's it's a shame, you know. I just I just miss the good old wrestling days back in the day. <laughs> where it was, yeah, I watch a lot of seventies and eighties, man. Where it was fun. There was always a storyline from start, middle to finish, and you have to admit, man, I miss that whole kayfabe. Oh. Yeah, I agree. But sadly, I don't believe it's coming back anytime soon. I think now, I think we've gone from the. It used to be the kayfabe, and now swerve you know i think now that they can't there's no way they can stop the information being leaked out so kayfabe is dead but they can swerve you they can misinform you <laughs> so i think that i think that's where we're at now i'll tell you a match that really got good and i really enjoyed was the uh tag team uh championship ladder match between jimmy uso john morrison and kobe kingston and the thing i liked about that whole match was was between john morrison and kobe kingston they put on a hell of a show man um they made each other look good in the ring um you know they played each other out they sacrificed their bodies and were doing all kinds of crazy moves and high flying tricks they brought it to the table in the ladder match, that's for sure. And I will say this, that was the match of the night behind the Boneyard. There's no doubt in my mind. Those guys, they brought it. Uh, it was a classic three-way dance since the Miz wasn't able to be there. And at first I was like, what the hell is going on? And then we, I talked to old Jack Lord. And he dropped the information bomb. He's always got the info. He was, yeah, he let me know that the Miz couldn't make it. So I liked them really good. Those guys are innovative, you know. I liked it too, and then uh, Jimmy Uso kind of put his game on a little bit too, but the weird thing about that whole match, the ending was weird where they were all climbing up the ladder and they are both, yes. they were trying to get the uh, SmackDown tag titles, and all of a sudden it all snapped, and the next thing you know, you see John Morrison falling down and the tag titles landed on him, and they gave it to him in The Miz. Yeah, it was a real cloudy finish. Uh, Kofi and Jimmy looked like they didn't know what to do once the, the armature had been taken down or whatever you want to call it once that the thing had been taken down that had the belts on it even before Morrison fell backwards you could tell they just had like a look of confusion and, and you could tell that it kind of went cloudy but uh, great great match man Morrison shined and stood out in my opinion he's fucking Spider-Man running across the top rope I couldn't believe that shit I know he's always been great. I mean, if you followed him, you know, through you know Luchador Underground Wrestling, Impact Wrestling, you know, all those great places, you know, to me he's like a superhero, and I do agree with you. He is like Spider Man on those ropes. Did you see how he was just walking on those ropes like it, it was just and normal? He made it all the way across. <laughs> I know it. It was wild. And then at the ending, when the tag titles landed on Morrison, you have to admit though, he kind of looked puzzled too when he had those titles. I think that he, well, it may have been, maybe the finish didn't go exactly the way they thought it was going to go, or maybe he clunked his head on the as he was coming down, which is a good possibility. But, yeah, it was a, it was definitely a, I'm not going to say a muddy finish, but it was cloudy. I'll tell you this, though, you talked about Jimmy Uso. For fans of old school wrestling, I got three words for you. Buddy Jack Roberts. Jimmy Uso was a bump monkey out there, man. He was getting his ass thrown all over the place, just like the old Buddy Jack and the Freebirds, man. Oh, I know. I remember that match. That was a classic match. You gotta love the Freebirds, especially the Free oh, <laughs> Freebirds. Jack used to get his ass thrown all over the place, I and mean, then you know what I mean. You had Bam Bam coming in to clean everybody up, but while Michael Hayes was dancing and prancing, but the the real workhorse of that threesome was old buddy Jack, man. And last night you saw that Jimmy. He was bumping all over the damn place. Oh, yeah. Um, there were some uh, fans, you know, talking about how, uh, you know, Michael Cole was a good announcer and they said they should put him up there with Chris Collinsworth. And I was like, no, you don't put uh, <laughs> you don't put Michael Cole up there with Chris Collinsworth. Uh, Mike, Michael Cole, I'm not going to he does. I'm not going to shit on Michael Cole. <laughs> He's got a headset in the side of his ear and he just regurgitates a lot of what he's told from the gorilla. I'm not saying he's not a good announcer. I like Michael Cole best when he was getting bullied by The Rock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That was so priceless, man. But like you said, you have to agree, uh, he shouldn't be up there if Chris Collins were. <laughs> oh, no. No. <laughs> and then when no. someone told me that, I started laughing. I was like, that is shouldn't have even been said. I mean, that made me feel stupid <laughs> just hearing that. <laughs> All right. Let's, yeah, let's talk about... Uh, Captain CrossFit and Kevin Owens. 
Oh my gosh, that match was crazy. The one favorite thing I liked about that match was when um, they were using the ring bell, you know, hitting, <laughs> getting hit in the head like three times. You hear this ding, ding, ding. That was classic, man. For all the old gamers, there used to be a video game on 64. I don't remember the name of it, but you were in a wrestling game. You could reach out from the side, reach into the crowd, and pull back a foreign object. And I always used to throw them all the way till you got the ring bell, man. And then you would hit ding, ding, ding. It's not like school was in session. I was laughing at that. That, that kind of reminded me of that one match between uh, Steamboat and the Randy Macho Man Savage when they used the ring bell, too. I was thinking about that when Kevin Owens and you know uh, Seth Rollins was using that ring bell. Well, that's a compliment to those two guys to compare them to Steamboat and Savage. Holy shit. I did. That's kind of, I'm kind of reminded of it. And the cool thing is, you know, of course, Kevin Owens prevailed. Yeah, well, I, Shane McMahon's not around, so somebody had to do the big bump. Kevin Owens went to the top of the, you know what I mean, the big logo and bumped yep. off that. It was good. It, it, you know what I mean? I like the fact that they took EQ ending after the bell, after he dinged him in the head and, and all that, and they took it to the, you know what I mean, the no disqualification ending. I think that was a good turn. I think so, too. And, and I loved how Kevin Owens would be dodging all those uh, – Stomps by uh, Seth Rollins too, which is priceless. Seth Rollins sells like a champ. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that he doesn't, but I just can't talk for the guy. I can't get over for him. I'm not gonna say he's not quality. He's just not for me. I don't think so either. And if you go back during the Ring of Honor days, where uh, you know Owens and you know Rollins back in the day was Steen and uh, Black, they had that mm-hmm. great chemistry as well. And then watching that match between them. Uh, last night, um, they did have that chemistry. Yeah, you could see that they 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 were clicking, so to speak. But yeah, I just can't uh, I can't get over for Rollins. I had to see Owens win. Yeah, me too. I was happy about that, and I love Kevin Owens. Um, let's talk about uh, the Universal Heavyweight Championship between uh, Bill Goldberg and Braun Strowman. That match was too short. It should have been a little bit longer. All it was was power slams, spears, power slams, spears, power mm-hmm. slams, spears. And it was a bit. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, my brother. What did you say? It was what? Oh, that's all it was. It was power slams and spears match. And it was about time they gave Braun a title. I agree. Well, I wasn't expecting no Carl Gotch match going into it. No, no nothing technical. I knew that it was just going to be a couple of gorillas pounding their chests and running into one another. But it was. Uh, I liked that Strowman took the title. I think that it was good. Um, I he stepped up. You know what I mean? Roman Reigns didn't want to make it because of everything he's got going on, which is totally understandable. But the Braun stepped up and grabbed the brass ring and they gave it to him. And I think that's how it should be. Well, they should have gave it to him a long time ago. They kept on teasing with him with it for a long time and never gave it to him. And then when he finally did, I was like, it's about freaking time, Vince McMahon. I wish he would have beat on Goldberg a little more. I've never been a Goldberg mark, even when he was running the streak in WCW. I was glad to see Goldberg take a beating. Yeah, me too. But my one favorite match of the night was the Boneyard match between my boy AJ Styles taking on the American Badass slash The Undertaker. And that whole match, um, I was doing some research on that. It took five hours to film that that segment to get it just right. And the cool thing I liked about that whole match, it was filmed like a movie log. You know, it was like it reminded me of watching a mini horror movie with a. Uh, with a horror soundtrack. It, that match was just so fun to watch, man. I loved it. It was a great match. Let me just, I know everybody's going to be popping for it, but there's a lot of reasons that you can look deeper into that match to find reasons that it was good beyond the fact of its aesthetics, the cinematics, the, the multiple camera shots. It was, uh, it was really good. And you say that it, it took five hours to film. That only goes to The Undertaker's benefit. Because let's be honest, up until this point, The Undertaker has given us some lackluster performances. It's a super showdown, different places. He's come up on the underside of things. Being able to take those breaks and not be winded, 
and stay fresh. The camera angles, the way it was shot. The Undertaker walked away from this match looking stronger than he's looked in years, in years. And it did a lot to help further his career as far as uh, stability and him coming back. If he continues to do matches like this, his career's got another decade. But I don't think he could go serious matches for another two or three years. But I, this was really, really good and played so great to his weaknesses to make him into strengths. I think so, too. And I love towards the ending of the match where Undertaker um, grabbed AJ Styles right there before he was going to throw him into the, uh, you know, <laughs> to the pit. And and I love how AJ was selling it real good. He was all scared. He's like, I, I don't want to be buried. I don't want to be buried. And yeah. and he was he was like, you know, shaking in his boots. I mean, that was some good acting. <laughs> Yeah, both guys, you can't just, and, and Taker's going to get a lot of praise, but both guys, you can't have a, some, a great dance without, without two good dancers, and, and both guys brought it. But the fact that, that it was shot in, in a movie style really made that match the better for those guys, and especially the better for Taker, because it made him look really, really good and brought him back up to a level that he's been needing to be at. What about when he hit the car window? Do you think that that was a work, or do you think he really hit the car window and cut himself, or do you think that was all makeup? Because it was gashed open pretty good. I think he, he really uh, hurt himself on that window. I, th- I don't think it was all acting. I think <coughs> they um, really did that, and I think he really did get, um, cut his arm. Let's talk about the match flow itself. Because normally, and this again, to the fact that it was innovative. Normally, Taker was the face going into this match. But whenever the match started, he was full on heel. I think beat so. Him down, beat him down, talked to him the whole time he was doing it. They flipped everything at the beginning of the match. I mean, people are just going to watch the match and be caught up in the, the cinematics of it, aren't going to notice these little nuances of the wrestling fans like we will notice. He started out heel. Oh, and then turn back. It was it was crazy. It was it was great great progression in the match. And give me more, man. I would like to see more like this. Me too. And I loved how he beat up uh, Gallus and Anderson. That was priceless. I liked the way the tempo shifted when those guys came in. The music changed. Everything shifted. It went to a. Di- uh, you, it was it was great storytelling. I- amazing. The one thing I liked about it before the Boneyard match started, you see this hearse backing up into the uh, you know uh, graveyard, and I'm sitting there going, uh-oh, that has to be an undertaker. And all of a sudden, uh, you see these guys uh, pull out this casket out of the hearse, and they open it up, and it's AJ Styles doing this crazy cynical laugh, which was priceless. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed that. Since they turned, then I didn't know which, which incarnation of the Undertaker they were going to use going into Mania this year. But whenever they chose the American Badass, I, I figured he would come in on a bike. And it was really cool the way that they did those long shots. I did too. And I love on the Indian where he left and he still cruised off on his bike. Yeah, and then the flames and all that. Yeah, it was it was good. I know, and that was my favorite match of uh, you know WrestleMania Part 1. And then when I was online, there was still a lot of people complaining about it because it sucks, because there was no audience, and it was boring. You know something? I you know I really enjoyed it, man. Um, you know, I, I took it with the benefit of the doubt, and I just really enjoyed myself. Um, I'm not going to lie. It was kind of hard watching all these matches without you know the audience participation, though. A big part of WrestleMania is the audience. The audience is part of the show. And I missed the big stage and the fire would have gotten and all that stuff. I missed all that pomp and circumstance that comes along with the biggest show of the year. But it was still good, man. At the core of it all, it's it's it happens in between those ropes. And what in my opinion, you know, like, I'll, I'll quote Tony Soprano. Some people can have a Virginia ham underneath their arm and still complain they got no bread. It don't matter how good some people got it, they're going to find a fault. I totally agree with you. And then two other people who would also enjoyed this last night as well was our friend Jack Lord and also Bob Cook. Bob Cook uh, just loves, you know, getting on people that are like slamming on WWE and, you know, and Jack Lord's the same way. And those guys are just great. 
Yeah, Jack Moore got a little heat on me last night for a second. I had to rib him a little bit, old Baldy Locks. <laughs> I know, right? And then also Bob Cook, man. I don't know if you're reading Bob. Bob was ribbing a lot of people, too. That's good to have fun, man. You got to be able to laugh, you know? <laughs> exactly. You start taking shit too serious and you forget what you're, you know what I mean? It's it's uh, it's not Shakespeare to, you know what I mean? But I guess it is to a certain extent, but you, you can't, you got to have fun, man. I know you're having fun on this uh, podcast right now because since you're called the Hi Hat, I know you smoked a big, nice little doobie. <laughs> well, I'd be a liar if I wasn't to agree. <laughs> I love it. Now, let's talk about the matches tonight for uh, WrestleMania Part Two. Let's go and let's let's say our predictions. Um, first one, let's talk about it's for the WWE Championship between uh, Brock Lesnar and Drew McIntyre. Well. I'm going to go ahead and put this out there. I feel bad for Drew McIntyre because he's had this story of retribution. He was shunned by the company. He went away, built himself back up, came back, won the big match at the Rumble, threw Lesnar out, set the stage for this great retribution story, and now it's kind of been taken away from him because, you know what I mean, of the, of the virus. So uh, I think that... McIntyre is going to win. I think they're going to put the belt on him just because of the retribution story. And WWE has a tendency, which is good, of awarding people that have, you know what I mean, went the extra mile to get back. But you never can tell, man. Lester's a beast. He could shit on that and just be like, I'm, I'm not going under for the guy. We'll see. I'm sure Brock will do business, though. I think so, too. And you just got to love those Paul Heyman promos, too, man. I like the fact that Heyman... We're quarantined now and all that bullshit's going on. Heyman doesn't have to stand in front of a massive crowd and be this huge, boisterous orator. He's talking quiet. He's talking silently. He's doing the Jake the Snake cool, smooth promo. And I like that, man. I do, too. And speaking of Jake the Snake, he did that cool, smooth promo over at AEW, too. <laughs> yep. I got to I got to be honest. I only get as much AEW as I can get online. I don't have the uh, regular weekly access, which is going to change soon. But yeah, the stuff like that is going to put AEW over. But let's stay on WWE right now. I like me some AEW, but I don't want to I don't want to shift the focus. Oh, I know. I just I'm the last man standing. Yeah, the last man standing between Edge and Randy Orton, they go way back. They've teamed with each other. They wrestled with each other. This whole storyline's been great, and it's so great seeing Edge getting back into the ring again after that nasty injury he had. Um, and I think this is going to be one of my favorite matches because you know they're going to go in at 100% each of them, and they're going to beat the living crap out of each other. This is another match where I wish Edge would have the benefit of having that crowd there because it is a comeback. But they've got so much history, and and they know each other so well. I expect this to be a really crisp match. I, you, you're not going to see a, a lot of bullshit in this match. It's going to be a, a clean story, and it's, I'm excited. Yeah, I agree with you. It's going to be a crisp, uh, solid match in my opinion. Now, let's talk about uh, another match. Let's talk about the Raw, the Raw Tag Team Championship, uh, the Street Profits uh, versus uh, Austin Theory and uh, Angel Garza. Now, I like the Street Profits a lot. I like the fact that they can, they can work with the crowd and, and feed off the crowd. Now, is that going to be a detriment to them going into this? We'll see. Austin Theory and Garza workers. I've seen Austin Theory work in the independence coming up. Uh, great worker, you know. I there was I knew when I seen him, there's certain guys out there. There's Austin Theory and other people that I've seen in my travels that you, when you see him, you know. It's only a matter of time before this person will have the right set of eyes and he's going to get a push. So, uh, he's great in the ring. I think it's going to be good chemistry between a lot of young, hungry guys. I think so, too. Now, let's talk about the NXT Women's Championship. Uh, Charlotte taking on Rhea Ripley. And I love Rhea Ripley. She's a beast. And um, I want Rhea Ripley to keep her NXT Women's Championship. That would be good if she could win. But I think this is the opportunity for them to elevate the NXT brand even more than it has been if they book it right. If I was booking this match, I would have Charlotte Flair win. And then... 
she could bring the NXT title onto the main stage, whichever show she wanted to represent. Bring it onto that show. Have Rhea Ripley chase her for two months. She could do that. And the whole time that title is on the main stage, it's getting more focused than it would be on Wednesday night. Not to say that it's not good and it's not top tier on Wednesday night, but it's not prime time. I think they have an opportunity to elevate not only Rhea Ripley, but that NXT brand and women's championship if they play this right. But if they go in and just have Rhea, Rhea Ripley win, it's I mean, she's won, but where have they taken anything? I think so, too, and I love how they're pushing Rhea Ripley, too, because she's getting well-known on the big stage as well. I like that Mad Max look she's got going on myself. She has that um, Mad Max, like, heavy metal kind of thing yeah, going man. on. She looks like punk rock 80s. I know, I'm waiting for her to pop out a guitar and just start tearing it up on her intro. <laughs> 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 that would be so cool, man. <laughs> All right. She needs, to do, she needs to do the uh, humongous promo. She needs to walk out in her road warrior looking gear. Just walk away. <laughs> that, <laughs> Give me that title. Just that, walk away. <laughs> that, fuck, I, I, it's like hell for that. That would be awesome. Another match I'm looking forward to. Um, I'm trying to figure it out, but I don't know. I hope it's just as good as the Boneyard match. Let's talk about the Firefly Funhouse match. Uh, John Cena taking on the Fiend Bray Wyatt. I fully expect to see another cinematic production there. I know, and I'm trying to figure out where this is going to go, because it can go either way. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I do not like John Cena. I think he's overrated. And I hope, uh, you know, uh, Bray Wyatt wins. I would like to see Bray Wyatt win as well. I think uh, I'm not going to say anything negative about but I think there's some, some retribution that needs to be made from the performance with him and Rollins in the Hell in the Cell match. That took a shit. So I think they need to give The Fiend a, a stage to step up to again, and I think this is that point. John, uh, he's so vanilla. Uh, he looks like Ernest P. Worrell. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> he's a, he's a, it's just one of those things, man, but he, he's, he puts it in. He puts in the work. He sells. He brings up to the level it needs to be brought up to. I don't mark for the guy neither, but I'm not going to take away from his abilities in that ring. I don't think so, too. And they should give it to the Fiend Bray Wyatt, too, especially when they uh, ruined it on uh, the Fiend when they uh, let him lose to, you know, Bill Goldberg. I would like, yes, yes. That's another thing that they've, they've dumped on the Fiend. I would like to see some new de- character introduced if they do do a cinematic version like they did in the Boneyard. I would like to see uh, maybe not uh, what was that sister? I can't think of her name. Sister Abigail. Uh, Yeah. I don't know if it'll be Abigail or not, but I would like to see some new element introduced and I think that's a really good opportunity to do so. I think so too. It's going to be a great match. Um, Let's talk about the prediction for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Bailey versus Lacey Evans. Uh, and then Sasha Banks in elimination match. Uh, what do you think is going to happen in that match, um, Bailey? Um, I don't. I I can't take her seriously as being a heel or a badass. That's just my opinion. That's, what's your prediction? Time you have more than three people, anything more than a triple threat. You got the Fatal Four Way, and now they got this Five Fatal Five or whatever they're calling it. You got the potential for the shits because you got. A lot, especially now in the days of the scripted, the scripted match in the ring, they've got all their spots set up, predetermined. Nobody really flows like they, if they could flow and stay moving, that'd be fine. But I expect to see a lot of high spots and not really a lot of wrestling. And it being an elimination match, chances are pretty good we'll see two or three people go real fast. Um, I'm just not a popular opinion, but I think Lacey Evans is ready for a push. I Five, think Bailey and Sasha can stand on their own. Naomi and Tamina really aren't going to get a push. I think Lacey Evans is ready for a push for the belt. I think so, too. And I think Lacey Evans deserves to be the SmackDown Women's Championship. She has she can do a good promo. She has that good presence about herself. And um, I hope she wins it. Well, from day one since she got there, I've always said that I wanted to see her and Flair as a, as a tag team. I think her and Charlotte Flair would make an amazing tag team. Like the old Twin Towers, only in the women's division. 
I think so, too. That would so rock. Now, let's talk about uh, Alistair Black taking on Bobby Lashley. These early, the early matches, I'm kind of lackluster on them. I mean, they're curtain jerkers. I like Alistair Black's character a lot. I'm uh, kind of a dark-hearted person like that, too. I like the, the sinister type stuff he's got going on. He got dealt the Bobby Lashley card. Bobby Lashley can't emote any feeling. The most blank-faced person I've ever seen in my life. No matter what they do to try and push this poor guy, he just can't. He can't sell it. He's a great athlete, but he just can't. He can't sell. I'm sorry to the Bobby Lashley fan. The truth. Me too. Me too. Um, uh, the one uh, match in the kickoff show, I, sh- I don't think it should be in the kickoff show with with uh, one of the uh, participants, is Natalia taking on Liv Morgan. I love Liv Morgan, and she shouldn't be on a kickoff show. She should be, like, <laughs> on WrestleMania. Well, they're trying to rebuild her back up again. And after the performance that both women had in the Elimination Chamber, I mean, they didn't win, but Liv Morgan got thrown around like a rag doll and still kept... So I think she earned a little bit higher spot on the card, but there's still a lot of people that didn't even get that kickoff show. So you got to look at the silver lining, I guess. But I think that she earned a higher position in the card than that, yeah. I think so too. Let's talk about Otis versus Dolph Ziggler. I love that whole storyline, you know, with uh, Mandy Rose. And and another thing that's um, bothered me is who's this mysterious uh, computer hacker that's showing all these like incriminating videos as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's the wild card they're playing in this match. And as far as Mandy Rose goes, anytime I get to see her walking away from anything, it's a good day. So oh. that's, yeah, I'm good with that. I love Mandy Rose. I love how she <laughs> I love how she struts Catch her stuff. Hell. But uh, Otis, I'm on the heavy machinery. I like that tag team, but I don't think they've found their niche. I don't think they've found the fan base they need in order to get the push that they've got coming. I'm not saying they're not talented enough for it, but they're not over enough for it. And Dolph Ziggler, man, the guy's he's a worker. You know, he's and people want to throw that term around job, or I don't necessarily like that because he's out there getting it done, but I can't. He's another one of these CrossFit type guys that I just can't. I can't mark for if I think. If I think I can whoop their ass, I really can't mark for them. I'm not saying I'm a badass or nothing, but if, I, if they're a little skinny like that and I think I can whoop them, then I probably ain't marking for them. All right. This has been great so far. So for uh, um, tonight's WrestleMania part-time show, um, what are the two matches you're looking forward to seeing and um, the ones you think are going to uh, steal the whole, the whole WrestleMania of part two? I think Edge and Morton have, have the, the propensity to steal the whole show. I think they could take the whole thing. I really, as much as I, I'm not a fan of either Cena or The Fiend, after the Boneyard, I'm curious to see the Firefly Funhouse match. And uh, the Lesnar match is going to be big bumps. You know what I mean? That's going to be action no matter what. Rhea Ripley and Flair, any of those matches could could take the show. You know? I think so too. Okay, let's let's um let's pick our picks for tonight. I mean, this is just a prediction. All right, between the WWE Championship, Brock Lesnar versus Drew McIntyre, who do you have won in that match? I think they're gonna push Drew McIntyre. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm going for Drew McIntyre on that one. Um let's do the last man standing uh between uh, Edge and Randy Orton. I'm going for Edge. I think Randy Orton's gonna win, but I think there's gonna be something crazy happen. And if they get Beth Phoenix involved, that could further the storyline on to on to the next big pay per view. But I'm thinking that they're gonna since Randy Orton has got the longevity in the company and Edge is just coming back for a short run. I think they're gonna push Orton. Yes, and the Raw Tag Team Championship. Um, I want um, Austin Theory and Angel, Angel Garcia to win. Garza to win. Excuse me. I think the Street Profits are gonna retain. Yeah, I think so too, but I would love to see Austin Theory and them have the belts. All right, um, let's do our predictions for the Firefly Funhouse match between Cena and The Fiend Bray Wyatt. I'm going for Bray Wyatt. Yeah, John Cena's going to go under, but it's going to be something spectacular if they do. You know I mean? They're going to try and make it something spectacular. We'll put it that way. All right, and then the NXT Women's Championship between Charlotte Flair and Rhea. Um, I love Rhea Ripley, but I have a feeling they're going to give the uh, NXT Women's title to Charlotte Flair. 
you heard what I you heard my booking plans. I would definitely give it to Flair, and I want to see her win and, and do just what I said. And then for the SmackDown Women's Championship, I want Les- Lacey Evans to be the new champ. I agree. That's uh, that's what I've been looking forward to. Um, and then for um, and who cares about the kickoff show? Yeah, match? for the kickoff show, I would say Liv Morgan, Otis, and Alistair Black. I, I think so too, and this is going to be a you know great time to watch some WrestleMania. I really enjoyed part one last night. I was over at my friend's house watching it, and it was great. And thank you so much for uh, coming on today and um, coming on to uh, the WrestleMania 36 <laughs> uh, after show for part one. And I'm also looking forward to doing a, another episode for part two, which be um, pretty fun as well. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me, my brother. Y'all be safe out there. All right, and everybody else, um, you can follow me at Russell Popcast at Twitter at Rob Kicks, Facebook at Russell Popcast. You can uh, follow my show Russell Popcast on the uh, platforms of Spreaker dot com, iHeart Radio, Spotify. Apple Podcasts, CastBox, Podcast City Network at PodcastCity.net, Hidden the Marks Podcast Network, and you can subscribe to WrestlePopcast on YouTube. And everybody have a great WrestleMania weekend.